If you've been shooting film for a while, and now you want to build a great manual focus film system, maybe I can be some help. I went through that process myself recently, and spoiler alert, I ended up with a Nikon. My name is Rob Skew, and I've been shooting film for over 50 years, and working as a professional photographer for over 45 years for clients like Major League Baseball, the NFL, and I've been published in Sports Illustrated, National Geographic. Maybe some of these techniques I've learned will help you as you learn about film photography. Well, the first question is, why was I looking for an SLR system in the first place? I've been shooting with SLRs for years in the past as a pro photographer. However, I kind of migrated to Leica rangefinders and I found myself without an SLR system. And the problem with rangefinders is that they're great for two or three types of photography and they're horrible for anything else. So just like 50 years ago, I wanted to switch from a rangefinder system and start shooting with an SLR again. So I had an idea what lenses I wanted, but I didn't know what system I wanted. So let me go through my process and what I've eliminated and what I ended up with. Now the first consideration for me was I wanted a working camera that I could use semi-professionally and get a lot of use out of. I wasn't looking for some kind of classic vintage experience where I was going to shoot one roll of film a year with it and take pictures of it with coffee cups and stuff like that. I was looking for a working system. So that eliminated a number of things. The first thing it kind of eliminated was a system that I started with decades and decades ago, the, the Pentax system with the screw mount. Hey, they were great at the time. Pentax abandoned them because they, the screw mount system wasn't that great. So if you were looking for a working camera that you're going to go daily with, those cameras are too old. Move on from the Pentax screw system. Now the next system that I kind of considered was the Pentax K-mount. Now this is a manual focus lens and film cameras. And people talk about, oh, you should get a K-1000. You know what? They're clunkers. I used the K-1000. They were an inexpensive entry point camera. It was the kind of camera you would buy and put on a copy stand because you needed another camera just to leave on the copy stand. Uh, they didn't have full features, they didn't take a motor drive, they were just clunky big things. And people talk about them now like they're some kind of sacred camera. Do yourself a favor, don't get a K1000, they're just an old clunker that people have great memories of. If you do want to get something from that era, and these cameras are now getting a little old, uh, but I would get the, the Pentax MX. I thought it was way better camera than the uh, K1000, way more camera. And the MX had manual, manual exposure, manual camera, so it kind of has held up well. Other cameras that I used professionally, I did use an MX. I also used the Super Program. It was a great camera, had great features, great TTL flash, I remember. However, it just didn't have the build quality. Once you knocked it off of the counter a couple of times, it, the body just wouldn't hold up. Now, if you don't drop it, it's probably fine. But anyways, those cameras are getting a little old as well. And I also used a Pentax LX. That was Pentax's pro type camera. And they had electronics problems. And the ones that I had, I had two of them. They had electronics problems and I ended up getting rid of them. So you're looking at now a very old camera, the LX, that might have had problems in the beginning. It had great features on paper, but in reality, it just wasn't really the kind of camera that you could go with. So if I was buying Pentax, I'd buy the MX. And since these cameras aren't expensive anymore, you might as well get yourself a nice black one. They look pretty sharp. Now another system that's quick to eliminate is the Minolta system. The Minolta system was for consumers. So again, you're buying a used camera and they're not that expensive used because they're old and a better one isn't that much more money. So again, I would stay with Minolta as a working pro. So I shot the NFL and Major League Baseball for decades and working at newspapers, I went to like G7, G8 summits. Hundreds of photographers at these events, never a Minolta user. They were just a consumer product and the pros just didn't use them. They used their light meters, but not their cameras. For the most part, there's always an exception, but I never met the exception with Minolta. So that's a, a line I would stay away from. Now, if you're getting this camera for $30 and it's a 700 or a 500 or something of the later manual focus vintage, I think those might be okay if you just want to be a casual shooter. But if you're going to try to do this and do a lot of foot film 
or you're going to start shooting weddings on film or things like that, again, I would stay away from Minolta. I just, I just don't see it as being a professional grade product in my view. And people are going to disagree with that. People who aren't professional photographers. Now I'm going to go on a weird aside here for a second and I'm going to talk about the Leica R system. Uh, not probably something you were thinking of or a choice that you were thinking of making. What, when I worked at the newspapers, we bought our own equipment and I, I shot with Pentax and then it just wasn't holding up so I had an opportunity to switch to the Leica R system. A used camera system came up available. And so I used the Leica R for a while. I had an R5 uh, that I bought used and I bought a new R4S model too. And those cameras were great. Now, if I, I wish I had bought the R6 or the R6.2. Uh, a photographer that I knew was Sebastian Salgado, he used the R6 and he, he really liked it. So I probably should have bought one of those. Uh, I didn't. They're available to use now. They're very moderately priced for what a great camera they are. The catch with the Leica system is the lenses are expensive. And I had made a list of lenses that I would want to have in this new perfect system I was creating. And one of those lenses is a 35-1.4. Now Leica made the 35-1.4 in the, in the R mount, but it's a very expensive lens used. It, it would be more than I'd be willing to spend on a, on a film lens these days. So the Leica R 6.2, great choice. A little bit clunky, but a great choice. But you, the, the lenses are expensive, and they didn't have as many lenses as you might think. Uh, they might have made a 28, 2.8, but I don't remember them making a, you know, two or three different 28s or two or three different 24s like Nikon had. So they made the one, it was a 2.8, that's what you lived with. They made a 135, 2.8, that's what you lived with. They... Uh, the 180s were very popular. They were nice lenses. These again, a little bit limited on choice and very expensive on the used market. And at a newspaper, you definitely, I mean, even if they were better, you couldn't see the difference after it went in a newsprint anyways. So a good choice, kind of an aside. I probably wouldn't go there now, but they were interesting and worth considering. Now another brand that is worth considering, uh, I when I started this search looking for a new SLR, I actually wanted to go this way, is Olympus. Now I live in Canada and Olympus never had a strong presence in Canada, but it was pretty good in the States. And when you worked at a newspaper, you went to these news conventions in, uh, in the States, the Northern Short Course and things like that, NPPA conventions. And Olympus would have their stuff there, and you could see they had some really cool lenses, like a 180 f2, and some of these uh, lenses were pretty intriguing looking. So when I started to reconsider getting an SLR, I actually thought I would get an Olympus. I always kind of liked them, so I bought some lenses, uh, kind of put together my little kit, and then I started to really look for a camera body. And the one I settled on was the OM4 Ti, so that's the titanium version of the OM4. And uh, I bought one of those and it had electronic problems. The, the spot meter is supposed to take a spot meter reading and you can add these up. So maybe you do four or five spot meter readings and it gives you an average. So the spot meter was working but this average feature didn't work. So I sent it back and then um, I, I bought it on eBay, returned it uh, for full credit. No, no issue but a hassle. And then I, I tried another one and it just didn't seem to have the build quality. So. Now I've bought some Olympus lenses. I've got a little lens system, but I didn't really find a body. And I thought, I'm just gonna have to cut my losses here and get out of it. So I think the OM4T, uh, it's a T, OM4TI in other parts of the world, but the OM4T is a very nice camera. I couldn't find one that I liked. And uh, I, the lenses seem good too, but I never really got the system working. The, the other camera that they had was the OM3T. And that was the full manual version of that camera. And they, they're probably magnificent, but they're, they didn't sell well. And they're very expensive. They're, they're in the $2,000 range compared to $600 for the OM4. Uh, as if you, so the OM3T was, is probably a great choice, but just not what I was willing to spend on a camera body. Uh, the other thing, the OM1 and the OM2, great cameras as well, but um, they're getting a little old now. And as they get older, the gaskets are, have issues and that. So those cameras 
great, but just too old if you're going to really start shooting with it on a regular basis. And the reason that they came up with the OM-3 and the OM-4 was because they updated and improved the OM-1, OM-2, which is what happens. So why would you go back to the unupdated version? So that's Olympus. I kind of like them, but in the end it didn't work out for me. Now this brings us along to, a, you know, well, there's only a few more choices. One is Canon. Now, I was never a huge Canon fan, but I can see nothing wrong with the Canon F1. Now, they, they had the original F1, and then they came up with the next F1, which people call the new F1, although it was really just called the F1, but it would be in the market now, it would be called the new F1. And some of my photography friends that I work with at different papers, they, they use that system. I never used it, but it looked like a professional system and I wouldn't hesitate to get a, an F1, a new F1. And that's the kind of camera that, um, you know, this, this would hold up for heavy professional photojournalism use where guys are shooting, you know, seven or eight rolls a day for weeks on end. And I've seen them really beat up and still working. So you could, you could save some money buying one a little rougher. Like when I, when I buy a camera, maybe I'm trying to buy one a little too clean and pretty, but it, you could buy a beat up F1 and still get a lot of years out of it. Especially if you're only shooting, I don't know, let's say five rolls a week. If you're shooting five rolls a week or less, probably a lot of people are shooting that amount, then um, a, a new F1, even if it's a little rough, would be fantastic and also if you could if you wanted to spend a couple hundred dollars more and get a better you know mint like new f1 well you'd never wear that thing out it would just go on forever so that's a, that's a good choice i never used it but photographer friends of mine used it and they they thought it was great it's it's a heavy camera with the motor drive but people don't tend to have motor drives with film anymore because they're not shooting sports with a film camera for the most part so that brings us to the, the final answer, which in this case was Nikon. Now I had a system in mind of what it was that I wanted to end up, end up with for lenses. I just needed a camera body. So I started to research and look at the cameras and remember the cameras that I used in that. I used professionally the, the Nikon F4 and F5 as autofocus cameras when I shot sports for Major League Baseball and the NFL. The F5 uh, probably was my best workhorse product that I ever used. Uh, but in this case, I was looking for manual focus stuff because I wanted to build a manual focus system. So I didn't go with the F5. The cameras I looked, I looked at the F, a uh, nice, too old, probably doesn't have a meter. At least the cool ones that are cool looking don't have meters because they just have a prism, prism finder. So the F would be a fun camera to take out on occasional weekends, but it's not something you're gonna start shooting weddings with or uh, try to do serious amount of heavy lifting with. The F2, uh, obviously an update, again, great camera. Uh, it's very old at this point and probably wasn't what I was looking for. The F4, the F5, the F6, I used all those and uh, great cameras, but I was looking for manual focus. So that kind of, if you're gonna go with the F line, that brought you to the F3. The other options, and I had owned these, was the FM line or the FE line. Um, I had an FM, it was great, uh, would be too old now for, for me to, for my use. The FE was great, I used those. The FM2, I never had it, but it would, it would be great. The FM3, which is really called the FM3A, because they kind of, they kind of combine the FM and the FE into this final product called the FM3A. I would buy that, that's a great looking product. Uh, it's, it's got all the features that you want, TTL flash as well. So the FM3A would be an option I would consider if I was buying a camera body. Again, I'm looking for something a little more premium. I'm not looking for, you know, some vintage thing that I want to just, you know, take three rolls uh, a year with. I'm just looking for something I could use. The FM3A is a great option. There's also the FA, wasn't really a popular camera, but uh, people loved it and if you can find a really clean one, that would be a good choice. So what happens is, to, to get into any system, you have to send, spend a certain amount of money. So it's not that much more money to get something really great. And I think the F3 is probably the, the pinnacle of the manual focus Nikon system. So that's what I would suggest, that's what I went with. Get an F3. These were 
super well built. I remember photographers having these, Jeff Bassett, he had the pro version, had a, it was a little different model, it was the F3P, had a hot shoe on the top, which they all should have had, but anyways, they didn't. But these cameras were, for working photographers shooting five, six, seven rolls a day, week on, week out, battered up, throw them in the trunk, take them on the ski hill, you know, climb rocks with them, whatever. These cameras were built for day-to-day -day use. And uh, if you're shooting at a lighter rate or you're shooting weddings and it's not as miserable uh, and you're not beating the gear up, I think you can buy an F3 and it'll last you the rest of your life. It, the, the, I bought a really clean one and I, I really, it's gonna outlast me. It will work flawless as far as I can see. Uh, you can still get the batteries, which is always a consideration with an older camera, but uh, the, the F3 would be my choice, and it was my choice. Now, I bought the T version, that doesn't matter, as long as you get the F3 HP, which is high eye point. So, they, they came out originally with a regular prism, and then they updated that like two years in to the, to the high eye point prism. And uh, you probably want to buy that one because they're just a little bit newer. And then again, as the process continued and the updates continued, they, they came up with the F3 titanium, what they call the champagne version, so not the black version. It was kind of a chromy looking, titanium looking camera. And the titanium doesn't help you at all. It's probably a couple of grams lighter, maybe it isn't. But the titanium ones were, were uh, later production, so the, you know the camera's a little bit newer. And the black titaniums came out after that, so they're newer yet. So again, if you're looking for a camera, these cameras are all 30 years old, but you can get a newer one if you go with the F3 titanium in black. Or, but, as I said, any of the F3s are going to work great. They did have some kind of weird versions. The F3P, as I mentioned, was a more professional photojournalism type product. I didn't have all the features, but it was weather sealed and things like that a little bit better and had a hot shoe, non-TTL hot shoe. Uh, there was some other versions as well, and of course there was gold-plated ones and things like that. But anyways, if you're looking for a new camera system, manual focus system that you can use day in and day out, I would say go with the Nikon. I went with the F3, super happy. I've had it for about a year. Fantastic. You'll never wear it out.